Welcome to Healthy vs. Toxic, the podcast where licensed mental health professionals explore what makes a relationship healthy or unhealthy or even abusive, all from a scientifically informed perspective. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I provide some of the subtle signs we see associated with the dark triad? Sometimes these are called the dark triad traits. So this would include psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism. So the dark triad includes, again, three traits. The first one is narcissism. And usually when we talk about the dark triad, we're talking about subclinical presentations. So not presentations that rise to the level of a mental disorder like narcissistic personality disorder. So with narcissism, we see characteristics like a sense of entitlement, grandiosity, being jealous of other people, being arrogant, and having a lack of empathy. Now, we also see manipulation here, but this is a characteristic we really see with all of the dark triad traits. So moving on to psychopathy, typically with the dark triad, we're talking about factor one psychopathy. So someone who's callous, unemotional, has superficial charm, and who demonstrates pathological lying. Moving on to the last trait, Machiavellianism. Here we see someone who's cynical, calculating, someone who has good impulse control. They tend to be goal-oriented, and they have exceptional long-term strategic planning skills. So again, these are all subclinical traits. Machiavellianism doesn't even have a clinical correlate. So with narcissism, of course, I mentioned there's narcissistic personality disorder would be an extreme manifestation of narcissistic traits. With psychopathy, antisocial personality disorder, but with Machiavellianism, there is no mental disorder version of that, even at an extreme level of Machiavellianism. So now taking a look at the subtle signs or different examples of dark triad traits. It's important to keep in mind here that the sources that I use for this are sometimes clinical, sometimes non-clinical. The information has been modified to protect the identity of individuals. Oftentimes these are composites. So a number of different stories taken together and kind of put together into a new story. The information comes from firsthand experience, supervision, case studies, literature, trainings, and conversations with other professionals. So it's also important to remember here that these are examples, subtle signs. They're not a guarantee that somebody has the dark triad traits. They don't mean that if you see one of these subtle signs, or even if you see all of them, that doesn't mean for certain that somebody has a dark personality. Again, the dark triad isn't a diagnosis anyway. It's just levels on a continuum. But either way, I know that the potential for misinterpretation is here, right? So if somebody hears one of these examples and they say, oh, I have a friend who does that. They must have the dark triad. That's really moving way beyond what is supported logically. Again, these are just subtle signs. And in order for somebody to really know if they have the dark triad, they would need to be assessed by a licensed and qualified clinician. So the first signs I'll talk about really surround the idea of hearing about somebody else's good fortune. So I'm going to use the example here of being in a work setting and a couple employees are like walking down the hallway and one says, hey, I just heard that another person in the company was promoted. So usually when we hear this type of news, when we hear that something positive has happened to somebody else, like being promoted from one position to another, the typical response would be to be happy for them, to recognize how their hard work and their achievements kind of led to that promotion, how they may have deserved it. A more dark triad, more dark personality reaction is a reaction that's indifferent, a reaction that suggests that the person was manipulative or unscrupulous, and that's how they got the job, or maybe they got the job because of nepotism. It could also be minimizing the promotion. So somebody could say, well, that job isn't as good as it seems. I wouldn't want that job. Or suggesting the person can't handle the job, like, oh, they're going to burn out. They have that promotion, and they're going to burn out. Another kind of phrase, a term I've seen associated a lot with the dark triad is this term glorified secretary. So somebody might say, oh, they got promoted to that position. They think they're important, but really they're just a glorified secretary. Now, this is a good example of what I was talking about before, that you can't directly connect these signs to 
knowledge that somebody has the dark personality. They don't necessarily indicate that somebody has it for certain. Because this term glorified secretary is used a lot by people that don't have dark triad traits. It's just a popular term we see. Another possible reaction here would be to kind of go the other way and kind of take credit for that promotion. So saying, I helped them get that job. Or it was planned all along, like it was collaborative, like, oh, we were working on this for a while. Even though it was just one other person being promoted, it had nothing to do with the person who potentially has the dark personality, but they're acting like it was coordinated, like they had something to do with that promotion. Now, a more Machiavellianistic type of response, again, that's part of the dark triad, would be more opportunistic. So, oh, that person got promoted. I wonder how they can help me. I have this project I'm working on. Maybe they can approve this project now that they've moved up a rank. So someone who's Machiavellianistic, when, when that personality trait predominates in the dark triad, they tend to look more at how the news can be helpful to them and not necessarily condescending, arrogant, or kind of making up fantasies or making up stories about how they were part of what happened. Now we can see kind of a similar set of reactions with bad news, right? So say the same situation is occurring, maybe in a work setting, walking down the hallway talking to somebody, and you talk about a colleague who lost their house. Their house was foreclosed on. So the normative response would be something like, well, that's unfortunate. I'm sorry to hear that. The dark triad response might be not caring, like, oh, that's a tough break, kind of indifferent, or pretending that they predicted it, saying, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. I warned them that they were managing their money improperly. Or it could be that someone takes that bad news and really makes it out to be worse. So they lost their house, which is already pretty bad, and they might say, well, it's worse than that. Almost like they know of another story. They know of another level to the story when there's no evidence to support that. And again, if we look at the Machiavellianistic reaction, we kind of see the same thing. More of an opportunistic way of looking at it. Like, oh, that person's losing their house. I wonder if I can buy it from them before it's foreclosed. Or if it is already foreclosed, I wonder if I can buy it from the bank. I wonder if they want to get rid of any property. Maybe they're moving to a smaller house now, so they have different goods in their house, different material goods that they want to get rid of, maybe furniture or whatever. So again, not really being concerned with the person's misfortune, except as how it might help them. The next example is what I call the poor listener example. So these subtle signs surround this idea that somebody's not good at listening. So if you're talking to somebody and they tend to be bored very quickly with what you're saying, if they don't seem to have empathy, if they're not connecting with stories, especially if the stories are a little affectively charged, meaning they have emotion in them and there's no reaction. If someone is planning their own better responses when you're talking to them, that's a subtle sign. So for example, if you're talking about what you did on a vacation and you can see kind of the whole time that you're talking, they're really not paying attention. They're kind of off in their own world. And then when they respond, it's only really tangentially related to what you're saying. So Maybe it's about the vacation, like about a vacation, but they talk about their most recent vacation and how really in every way it was superior and a better experience than what you just had on your vacation. So kind of moving to another cognitive stream. So they're not really paying attention necessarily to what you're saying. They're kind of halfway tuned in, but also processing their response. It's kind of a component really here of narcissism and a little bit of psychopathy. Another behavior wrapped up in poor listening that is a subtle sign of the dark triad is kind of a superficial smiling. And I've noticed looking away as well. So you're talking to somebody and they're shaking their head, they're nodding, and they're smiling a lot, but then they're looking away, looking at what else is going on around. And I think for a lot of people, this is fairly obvious. Like it's fairly easy to pick up on this when somebody's kind of just smiling and nodding their head, but they don't really care what you're saying. So really, there's no engagement. As I mentioned before, there's no empathy. But there's also no depth or insight. And this is really the superficial charm element that we see really mostly with psychopathy and narcissism. The next category I'll go over here is the idea of inflated 
interpersonal abilities. So if, again, you're talking to somebody and they bring the idea of a third person in the conversations, they talk about another person, and they indicate that they can manipulate that person into doing anything, if they view that person as either weak or strong, we call this splitting, and it has a somewhat strong association with narcissism. If they believe they can detect that that person is lying, and I don't mean from consistency errors, that's relatively easy. If somebody tells one story one day and another story the next day, it's fairly easy to figure out that one of those stories isn't true, but rather from nonverbals. They think they have some sort of, again, interpersonal ability where they can just tell somebody's lying. And usually, when pressed, they can't really even give good examples of what those nonverbals are because there's a lack of attention paid. Again, if somebody's self-centered or disinterested, they're not really going to pay attention to nonverbals very well. Someone who's Machiavellianistic, I think, has a better chance of this because they're interested in learning about people and making calculations. So they may actually pick up on nonverbals, but would probably be less likely to make the claims they can detect if somebody's lying, for example. Another interesting sign of the dark triad here is the ability to detect narcissism or being oblivious to narcissism. So I see this really on both extremes. If somebody believes that they can always see someone who's narcissistic, that tends to be associated with the dark triad, right? Again, kind of putting people down and assigning negative attributes to other people. Now, if somebody is oblivious to narcissism, that can also point to the dark triad. So if there's clear narcissistic behaviors going on and somebody doesn't seem to be aware at all, then this is really indicating a lack of repulsion, less repulsion. And we know from the research literature that if somebody's narcissistic, they tend to be less repulsed by other people's narcissistic behaviors. Now, the next area I'll talk about here is the area of fantasy. And this applies mostly to narcissism and Machiavellianism but I also see a tie-in with psychopathy quite a bit. So the idea here is that somebody is fantasizing about wealth, success, the ideal love, and we see different signs of this, like they would tell you about how they're planning the perfect business, how it's going to grow fast, how they're going to be wealthy, or on kind of a darker side, they're planning the perfect crime, like stealing money in a situation where no one's hurt, like no one's physically hurt, but they have this kind of detailed plan of how they steal money. I've also seen fantasies that involve owning really huge houses, like an estate or an island. And some of the times this involves a lot of companionship. Like, for example, if it's a heterosexual male who has the dark triad, they may talk about how they want to be on an island. You know, they're going to own this island and there's going to be a lot of women on the island. Or they're going to own a mansion and again, it's going to be full with a lot of women. So, Kind of, again, mixing this idea of really selfishness and inflated sense of romantic capabilities and a desire to have everything in life, to have every type of pleasure in life. Money, romance, not really love so much, right? Although ideal love is part of that sometimes. Success, power, all that's kind of woven into these fantasies. Sometimes I also see this fantasy manifested as someone who believes that they already have power. So it's almost like they're living a lie a little bit. So I see the expression, I run this place, right? Like people will say when they're kind of a lower level in a company, oh, you know, the people that run this company or say that run this company, they don't really run it. They're not really in charge. I run this place. I'm the one doing all the work. I'm the one who has all the power. Another element similar to this could be that they desire fame or already believe themselves to be famous. So the expression here that I hear a lot of times is when somebody's kind of confronted, when they feel like they're being challenged a little bit, they say, do you know who I am? Right? That's kind of an arrogant, condescending statement that implies that somebody is more important than the person that they're talking to. Now, the interesting exception here would be Machiavellianism. Someone who's Machiavellianistic does not want fame. They stay concealed. They kind of work in the shadows. So they usually don't have any real desire for it and certainly typically do not pretend to already have it. The next subtle sign is around the area of access to a secret. How does somebody react when they find out kind of an embarrassing or damaging secret about somebody else? So say that 
people are a member of like a social group that gets together, and one of the members has like a criminal record that involves a felony, like a felony assault. So a serious charge in their past, and somehow somebody with the dark triad finds out about that criminal record. Right? So we see a number of different possible responses depending on which of the traits predominate, right? So if somebody is mostly psychopathic, again, subclinical, but they have psychopathic traits, they might not care, or they might identify with that person and say to that person, well, I understand how you feel, or I've been in the same place. If somebody's narcissistic, the tendency would be that they're going to tell other people to create chaos and to kind of put that person down and then kind of say, well, oh, I thought everybody already knew, kind of like playing like they didn't really know what's going on there. Now, with Machiavellianism, the reaction, if that's predominating, if that characteristic is predominating, they would tend to conceal that information and try to connect with that person and gain an ally and promise not to tell other people in that group about that really embarrassing criminal history. And I would think a lot of times, especially if the Machiavellianism is strong, they would probably keep that promise because, again, they're about advancing their own agenda. Hurting someone or helping someone is really kind of irrelevant. They're not necessarily looking to hurt people. They're just looking to meet their goals. So if keeping the secret is more beneficial to the person who's Machiavellianistic, then they would probably do that. Next set of subtle signs I'll talk about are around the area of credentials. And this is kind of one of my favorite areas to see the dark triad traits. So we can look at this from two ways. Somebody who does not have credentials, like say in a workplace environment where certain credentials may be expected or certain credentials may be appreciated, or somebody who does have credentials. So they're comparing themselves to other people who do not have credentials. So by credentials, I'm really talking about educational level, any types of certifications or licenses. So anything that formally supports or indicates competency in a certain area. So let's say that somebody does not have credentials and they may have dark triad traits. They tend to use expressions like not impressed, like they'll look at somebody with credentials and say, oh, I'm not impressed, or that's just a fancy education they have. Anyone can do that. I heard that all you have to do to get that is just take a test. Or they could have a reaction where they look at the credentials as meaningless. They might be indifferent. And that's more of a psychopathic type reaction, just being indifferent and not caring about it. Now, if somebody does have the credentials, so if they have credentials in a workplace and they're talking about people that don't have them, they might say, well, there's really more to this than you think. It's not just all the hard work I went through. There's actually a lot more. It's exclusive. Almost everyone who tries to get this fails. So if you're talking about like a test, for example, they might say 95% of the people that take this test that I took failed. They might also imply that their credentials don't really accurately represent their abilities. They're really the best of the best. They're really the top end of performance compared to other individuals, even those who have their credentials. So it's really kind of a different story that you see depending on whether somebody is looking at someone who has their credentials and they don't have them, or again, if they have them. But either way, you see kind of a pattern there. You see kind of an arrogant pattern or an indifferent pattern and sometimes with Machiavellianism, again, we see kind of a set of characteristics, a set of behaviors that, that deviate a bit. So they might say, well, what is there to that credential? What, what do I have to do to earn that credential? So again, looking at it from more of an opportunistic point of view, not being jealous or not demeaning, but just saying, oh, I wonder if that person can help me to get this credential. Maybe they can give me the answers to the test. Maybe give me some advantage in taking that test. So really always looking for that angle. That's what we see with Machiavellianism. The next area of subtle signs involve retaliation. And this is one of the most, I think, common signs that doesn't happen all the time because it requires some type of rejection. So I'm going to talk about rejection here in terms of romantic rejection. So somebody's pursuing a romantic interest and they get rejected. So the normal response, I think, would be, of course, to be sad, to be somewhat unhappy, to be disappointed, to kind of wonder what could have been but ultimately to move on, to pursue another interest. What we see with the dark triad is kind of focusing on that rejection and maybe plotting an elaborate revenge 
that involves maybe smearing somebody's character, they might say things like, they will regret messing with me, right? So again, kind of an arrogant statement and really kind of a little bit of a threatening statement. Also, they might carefully collect information. And this would be more Machiavellianistic, but I would think there would have to be a good deal of psychopathy and narcissism there too. Because if somebody's purely Machiavellianistic, they're not going to take that chance and carefully collect information in an effort to plot some sort of revenge. But someone who's psychopathic and narcissistic would. So they might have some of the different characteristics from Machiavellianism, like impulse control, that allow them to gather information, analyze it, and kind of plot out a revenge strategy. So this really shows how some of the dark triad traits really work together to end up with certain results, like planning something like revenge somewhat carefully. So moving on to the next area, another subtle sign here would be around admitting when somebody's wrong. So if somebody is doing something wrong or has done something wrong and they're reluctant to admit it. So let's use an example here of in a workplace setting, somebody has a proposal. Let's say it's like an IT proposal. They have this idea how to improve information technology in a company. And they send it up for approval and it gets denied because it's really not well written, right? So they didn't really follow all the steps to get this proposal approved. So they typically would not admit that it was their failures that caused the rejection of the proposal. They might say that, well, this project was doomed from the beginning. It was never going to be approved no matter what I did. They might also say, and this kind of connects back to something I said earlier in terms of like the pattern here. They might say, well, I knew it would fail all along, and that was the plan. It was really something I had to do, and there's more to it that you don't see. So what they're really saying there is it didn't fail, in a sense, because all along it was somehow the plan that they would do all this work, and they would send up for approval, and it would get denied. They could also suggest that it's really more complex than you would know. I hear this a lot. So like not offering explanation, just saying, oh, there's more to it than you can imagine. It's really complex. There's a lot to this that's going on that you don't know, or you're not at a level where you're allowed to know. So again, we're kind of looking more at narcissism there, that arrogance and condescending attitude. So the last area I'll cover here, the last area of subtle signs for the dark triad, is around use of language. And we see a few different things here. One thing I've noticed with the dark triad is if somebody tends to use a lot of what I'll call fancy words when they know that the person they're talking to is not going to understand because maybe they already used that word before and the person didn't understand. So it's like they keep going with that, right? So they'll use these technical terms or just really unusual words, like for example, from the English language, and say it to a person as if they should know and kind of implying that they don't know they're not really smart enough to be in that conversation. So kind of, in a sense, weaponizing fancy language. Another angle in this is not admitting when they don't know a quote-unquote fancy word, right? So I remember a while ago working with this assessment that had different items on a list. It was a 10-item assessment. And there was this clinician, then she used this assessment, and when she would reach the ninth item, she would say to the client, we're on the penultimate item, right? And that's the correct use of that word, penultimate. It means second to last because ultimate means last. Now there's a noun version of ultimate that means the highest level of achievement. But here we're talking about the order in a list. And what she noticed from using this structured intake many times was that a lot of people would immediately say, oh, what does penultimate mean? What does that mean? And she would say, oh, it means second to last on the ninth item out of 10. And other people would say, oh, this is the best item, like, again, misunderstanding what penultimate means. But then later on, when she would go back and talk to them, those that had the dark triad traits were more likely to kind of defend that position of understanding the word penultimate incorrectly. So they wouldn't admit that they didn't understand it. So she would say, oh, I noticed that you thought that meant it was the best item. It's just the second to last. That's what penultimate means. And they might say something like, Oh, well, that's one definition of penultimate. Yeah, I was using it the other way. Well, there is no other definition to that word. Again, ultimate has two definitions. The adjective, second to last, the noun, 
highest achievement, but penultimate doesn't. It only has one meaning, as far as I know. So you would see kind of this just not admitting, not really wanting to own that they didn't know what the word meant. And then later on, she went to use the word anti-penultimate, right? That means third to last, and had really the same results. She would use that. She would get different responses like, oh, what's that mean? People that are curious, intellectually curious. And some people that did know what it meant, but then others that would say they thought they knew what it meant, or they would proclaim they definitely knew what it meant. And then later on, kind of, again, just not really take responsibility, not really admit that they didn't know what anti-penultimate meant. So that's kind of an unusual word. It's kind of a good example because it's a word we don't use very often at all. Really, both penultimate and anti-penultimate, not words you see every day. So my anti-penultimate point here in this video would be, again, cautioning against using the subtle signs for any type of diagnostic purpose. They're just subtle signs. Again, I know many people that have a lot of these different phrases they use that kind of match what I used here, and there's no dark triad traits, right? Subtle signs would have to be accompanied by behaviors and characteristics that showed a pattern, and again, we leave that to the licensed and qualified clinicians. As always, I hope you found this video on the subtle signs of the dark triad to be interesting. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Ars Longa Media. The producers for this show are Christopher Brightigan and Madison Linden. The executive producer is Dr. Patrick Beeman. For more content, please visit our website at arslanga.media. To leave feedback or suggestions, send an email to info at arslanga.media. To find more content from Dr. Grande, including a link to his YouTube channel and his other Ars Longa podcasts, visit our website at arslanga.media. This podcast is intended for informational purposes only and should not be construed as medical or mental health advice. Ars Longa, Vita Brevis.